The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello. Welcome to the Department of Special Needs Ministries monthly webinar series. In this month's webinar, we are celebrating mothers, especially mothers of children with special needs. My name is Rachel Chung, Disabilities Coordinator, Archdiocese of Washington, Department of Special Needs Ministries. Later in our webinar, we will welcome Melanie Clark, advocate, staff from the ARC Prince George's County, and mom of a young adult living with autism, and she will share her experiences. Mothers of children with special needs encounter many of the challenges of all mothers. Where will my son go to school? Will my daughter have friends? Are they safe, happy? These parenting challenges, however, are shaped by the needs of their children. Will my son get the services he needs to be successful in school? How can my daughter meet friends when she does not use words to communicate? How can my children be safe in the community when they run away from me constantly? Will my children be happy as adults? Will they find work, a place to live? I saw recently a book published by a mom living in Virginia called The Forever Parent. This is a very thought-provoking title as many parents who support a child, whether that child is under the age of 18 or an adult with intellectual and developmental disabilities, these mothers really face a lifetime of providing supports. And this could even include housing for their special needs adult or financial supports. These are big challenges, but there are ways our faith community can come together and be a source of support for our mothers. As Catholic Christians, we look upon Mary as our spiritual mother. I have seen different images of Mary shown here. It's very interesting that Mary changes to be the face of the people who imagine her. As we can see in these different pictures, they're from all different cultures all over the world. And see Our Lady of China, Our Lady Mother of Africa, Our Lady of Guadalupe, just to name a few. Mary herself faced many challenges as the mother of Jesus. As we can see from these verses from the Gospel of Luke, then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother treasured all these things in her heart. So what are some of these challenges that Mary faced as the mother of Jesus? How do you think she felt when people spoke against Jesus? Jesus himself was rejected from his hometown, as we hear in the Gospels. Did Mary hear news of this, that her son was rejected? How did she feel as being the mother of Jesus? We also surmise that Mary was a widow at the time of Jesus' crucifixion. She was there at the cross. We can just imagine the great pain and grief she felt as she watched Jesus suffer and die. Perhaps she wondered, why is this happening to my son? Why couldn't I prevent this suffering of my son? Yet Luke here describes Mary as taking all these moments as treasures in her heart. This probably included the moments of great joy that we experience as mothers and also great sorrow. We can draw strength from Mary as a parent, and indeed she was, a, is a mother. So what are some of the experiences of a special needs mom? Throughout my career as both a provider, a service coordinator, missionary, and a member of the team here at the Department of Special Needs Ministries, I have met many mothers with all different types of experiences. 
I think we can all agree here that special needs moms have a wide range of experiences they go through, perhaps even daily. Let's look at a few of these descriptions here. I love this image of the, the person here desperately trying to get to on time to all those appointments that we know mothers with children with special needs have to do. How about this one? We can do it. If you want to get something done, ask a special needs mom. So we know special needs moms are really women who get things done. This one really made me smile when I saw this one, but it is in his IEP. How many meetings do moms have to attend and go to to advocate and to make sure that their son or daughter gets all the services that they need to be successful in life? This one, I think, is a really apt description as well for a special needs mom. When you think you've been working for four hours and it's only been 17 minutes, how many times have you felt this yourself? You're striving and striving for your children to be successful. Um, and it is very, indeed, very hard work. So let us now hear from one of our mothers that we welcomed here today, Melanie Clark. Again, advocate, program administrator, and special needs parent. Uh, Melanie has been a good friend and partner of the of the Department of Special Needs Ministries, and she fulfills many roles both in our community and um, also here as a partner uh, with us here at the department. Uh, Melanie, are you able to join in with us? Okay. All right, if everyone can hold for one second. We will make sure to, to join Melanie in here. Oh, I'm sorry, Melanie. We had a small technical difficulty. Are you there? Okay. Can you hear me now? We can. We can hear you now. So thank you again for joining us today to talk about um, our our mom celebrating moms today in this uh, a month of mothers. Thank you for having me. So, uh, Melanie, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what is your role at the Ark of Prince George's County? Well, my role at the Ark is to support families um, in a way to get them engaged in planning for their family member throughout the lifespan. So I do this in various ways, workshops, um, we have educational seminars, we have programs to help people enroll into benefits, we have programs that help youth with employment, uh, we also uh, do what we call a membership workshop every month. So we do various things to help family members understand the journey of caring for their family member with a developmental disability. So I know, Melanie, you've met many moms throughout your own career here. Um, when you meet a mother for the first time, and it, I know it could be a mother in many different situations. She could be a mother of a child, an older teen, or an adult. Um, when you meet them for the first time, uh, do you offer any advice, <laughs> or if and if so, what do you tell them as you're meeting these mothers for the first time? I definitely offer advice. I would say definitely yes. And the first thing I want them to have faith in themselves and in their child. Um, you often get overwhelmed when you get the diagnosis, and so you start to lose faith in yourself. Like, can you? take care of a child with a disability or chronic health need. And so that's the one thing I always encourage people. Have faith in yourself. You can do it. Second thing is to educate yourself. Make sure you have understanding of the diagnosis, even the symptoms. Um, also, finding out any benefits that a family member can take advantage of to help them care for their loved one. And the 
third thing is to pace yourself. You can get overwhelmed in getting the diagnosis, understanding the educational need, educational need the family member might need, um, and planning, period. Uh, this, your schedule can just get out of control. And so I often tell people, pace yourself. That, that, that's really great advice because it can be overwhelming, I know, for parents, especially at that time of they finally receive that diagnosis. Yes. It, it, it's so overwhelming. People sometimes get uh, stop, they stop in, their, in the tracks. And I'm like, no, you got to keep going, but patient, though. Excellent. Um, what, what do you think uh, special needs moms need to do to be the best parent? they can be because I, I think all of us as parents, of course, we want to do the best job we can for our child. So what do you think are some things that they as moms in these uh, various different situations need to do? One of the things I think would be good for us to share with families is don't over schedule yourself. Uh, don't stress yourself out in trying to do everything. A lot of times you'll get a list of things that you need to do, and you will lose all sense of self. And you can't be the best parent if you're not healthy and um, emotionally well, physically well. So pace yourself. Um, don't over schedule your child's life in, in, in a lot of different appointments and, and different activities because um, you want to be up and well so that you can, you know, support your loved one throughout this, this journey because it's a journey. It's not a one event, you know, it's not one um, event. So you have to you know you're going through your elementary years, um, you, you're going through your high school years, and then you get to them um, adult years. And so you want to pace yourself as a mom and, and you're taking care of your whole family. So um, that's one of the things I say. Make sure you understand how to detox, uh, de-stress. Uh, those are important things that moms need to hone in on. I, I think that's a great thing for us as moms to do as well. I think often we believe that by doing more and more things, somehow we will make the situation better, but that can actually just increase everyone's stress. <laughs> Agreed. So uh, what, do you, what is the worst thing you have heard from people <laughs> that do not have a child, teen, or adult uh, with special needs when they give advice? Uh, what is the worst thing people can say? I, I know people want to be helpful and give advice, but, but what do you think is the worst thing that, that people can do when they're trying to give advice? Uh, they'll downplay it, like, oh, it's not, you know, not that bad. Um, that's one advice, you know, you need to consider that this is huge, and getting uh, a, a diagnosis um, that your child has a long-term uh, disability that will impact their life, you know, throughout their lifespan. And so sometimes people were just like, oh, that's not that bad. I know somebody else, mm -hmm. you know, has it and they're doing just great. And, and that's, that's good in one sense, but it's up when you're just, you have a baby and you're just <laughs> realizing your toddler um, may not achieve the goals that you had imagined. Um, that can be, you know, really challenging to hear as a, a young family. Um, one of the worst things that I think sometimes people can say to you is, oh, are you going to put them in a group home? Well, you know, my child is just three. So <laughs> why am I, why are we even having this discussion? Right. Because now you, your vision and my vision is not the same, you know, because I might have a vision that, you know what, uh, my loved one is going to do everything they were expected to do if they didn't have a disability. And now you just kind of put a lid on their life. And not to say that's a bad thing of living in a group home, but why would you ask me that? I'm, I'm not even nowhere near that. I have a toddler. And so those are sometimes things that people can say um, 
that can throw you off, you know, as far as, um, you know, giving, giving advice, you know, that's not the first time I'm going to tell somebody at three years, their child's three, uh, giving them advice that, you know, put them in a group home now, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so those just, and I think people don't, they don't mean harm, they just sometimes don't know what to say, or, you know, I've had somebody say to me, oh, I'm so sorry, and I was like, you know, my child's not dying. You know, they're not critically ill. They just have autism. You know, they just have a developmental disability, and I'm happy, and, and they look so sad. So those are sometimes, um, you know, you have to look beyond that. They Sometimes people just don't know. Um, I know another thing that um, other families sometimes say that I think can be not the best advice is fight for everything. You're going to have to fight mm -hmm. for everything. Mm -hmm. And just that word fight, is not a good way to live all the time. And there are things that you have to be aggressive about advocating, but the, using that word fight, because you just do not want to be on this journey and every um, situation or everything that you do, you know, you gotta fight. I'm, you know, I'm going to see this doctor, I'm gonna have to fight. I'm going into this mm -hmm. meeting with this teacher, I'm gonna fight. That's not, you know, that, that, that energy is not the kind of energy you want to carry. That's very, that can be very stressful for a parent. So that kind of advice, um, I don't like to hear people often offer. Family. Yeah, that, that's interesting. You, um, say that Melanie, I think I've experienced more on the service provider side. And, uh -huh. and I think when, um, people already come at the service provider with, a hardness if you want to say that in their heart <laughs> um it kind of helps it doesn't help the dialogue to continue um, um and 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 of course we know that sometimes as providers we failed mothers and and their sons and daughters certainly but um if we can't get to a point of dialogue um it's hard to move forward to figure out what what the best plan can be going forward right i agree and that, that that's all but but you know i know that as providers sometimes we do not meet the expectations <laughs> certainly um but but we have to have a dialogue and figure out how to move forward yeah that that's yeah. that's very good advice um what about what did what is the best thing perhaps you even heard for yourself that someone told you or what's what would be one of the best um pieces of advice <laughs> that a special needs mom can hear? I think one of the best um, advice that was given to me or given me an opportunity, uh, when asked, somebody asked me to join in, when they asked mm. me to participate, mm -hmm. like I was asked to participate in the art education committee. Mm. And I was like, okay, <laughs> you know, first of all, we want to be invited. This mm. is a very isolated mm -hmm. um, journey that we're on. So anytime somebody gives you an invitation to be a part of something, because you're still trying to figure out stuff, so it, it's helpful to get an invite. And, and that was um, life-changing, to get that invitation to be a part of an education committee. And I, I grew so much with the information and this, the, the fellowship of the other parents. Mm -hmm. um, so those are one of the things I always try to do is invite parents. Please come, be a part of this. I invite you to join the task force, to be a part of a committee, mm -hmm. to become a member. Um, that's one of the best things. I love to hear other parents say. They invite them to participate in a program. Mm -hmm. or, you know, that, that, is, that is key, that somebody inviting me. Because oftentimes you just don't up and say, yeah, I'm going to go to that. You, you go because you've been invited. Yeah. So um, that's the best thing that I got. Was that invitation? Wow, oh, that that's that kind of leads so well to Melanie to something I know you and I are passionate about, along with um, also Pam Rosansky, one of our other partners, about the faith community. And um, what is something? How do you think the faith community can respond to uh, mothers um, who are supporting children, or again, teen adults? Because we always think about the lifespan of the person, mm -hmm. right? They're not going to remain a child forever or a teen forever. So, um, how do you think our faith community can respond to um, to our mothers? 
Yeah, the, I think one of the best ways the faith community can respond to families is just reaching out because they might not be um, in the pew. So we've got to go out and find them. They are out there. And a lot of times churches will, will say, well, you know, we don't have anybody with a disability, <laughs> you know, attending our church. But we know that they're out there. Um, just a lot of times they're not coming because they haven't been invited. Mm-hmm. And so right. um, and sometimes they might not be feel comfortable like coming in because they've been rejected before a lot of times. Or they just, they haven't been rejected, but they don't want to get rejected. So mm-hmm. they're very fearful. So I think in the faith community, we really got to think of some um, creative ways of connecting with people um, with dis- developmental disabilities and their family because both of them need that spiritual formation. And so we just got to be very um, flexible, think outside the box um, and, and, and identify that they're, they're in our community and what's the best way to draw them in. And once we get them in, we have to ask them, like, what works for you? Mm, yeah. Because... <laughs> What works for everyone else is that Sunday service, but it might work better for me on Saturday evening, mm. you know, yeah, for various reasons, the sensory, you know, it may, it may be just too much to have so many people in, in the church at one time, and we might need a smaller crowd. We might need the music turned down a little lower, mm, mm-hmm. you know, the light's not as bright or, you know, just some, some different things that may make me feel inclusive mm. so that we as a family can go mm-hmm. and come together and fellowship. So I just think that we just need to think a little bit different, go different places like Jesus, Jesus with different places. You know, <laughs> right. we, so so we, we just really kind of really need to, to meet the needs of, uh, the developmental disability community, the, the, the family, so that the families is, is, can go and worship together. This is got to think differently. We just got to, you know, think just a little bit differently on how we uh, connect with them. And and I know one time I heard from a mother too regarding her own faith community. She saw on the church bulletin it said all are welcome, but she didn't believe it meant her and her. Uh, children. She had two. She has two children living with autism. So that was interesting. You just can't even just say all are welcome because for her, she was waiting for that invitation that you speak of, Melanie. That no, you are invited. <laughs> your son and your daughter are invited to the table because even yeah. even just saying all are welcome doesn't. A lot of times, special needs moms thinks, well, they don't mean me, right. Right. And, yeah. And, and it, it, it's it's very challenging on both on both sides because um, both sides don't know what they don't know. And we just need to come together and just strategize a little bit more. How can we identify uh, our community members that want to worship and want to be a, fo- a part of a, uh, of a spiritual family? Um, how, do, how do we connect with them? Right, right. And I think you're right, too, Melanie. It can change, of course, depending on the family. I know I've uh, worked with some of our churches here, and I said, your program this year will be different next year, depending on the children who come. <laughs> and, and, and and we should be ready for that change because their needs are, are dynamic and they're going to change. So we can't just keep the same program even year after year we're going to have to adapt to to meet their needs um as well key word is adapting adapting that's right (laughs) that's right (laughs) and i know melanie you probably heard this many times as a service provider um i also often hear oh people with special needs don't like change i said no Nobody likes change. Right. <laughs> it's, Nobody it, likes change. It's not unique to the special needs community. <laughs> it's all of us. Right? You know, we yes. need to be, but we need to be adaptive and ready to change. True. I agree. So, um, Melanie, we kind of touched on this a little bit, but um, would you like to share with us a little bit about your own experiences as as a, a special needs mom? Oh, wow. Um, 
you know, over the years of, of uh, care for a child with uh, autism, a developmental disability, anxiety included in there, some mental, uh, you know, concerns too. My journey has been interesting um, in, in different um, stages of how I cope mm. with her having um, the disability. And I often say, um, you know, it's, it's interesting uh, when you're on this journey and you don't have a, a, a plan. You don't know, you know, you're just like on it. And it's almost sometimes you feel like you're driving without a map mm. or GPS. <laughs> and so I, I feel like from my experience, um, and she's 26 years old now. And I look back and, you know, I, I, I really um, don't know how sometimes I got through it. Like, and I know that it was my faith. It mm. was my relationship mm-hmm. with God. And, and sometimes you don't even realize it, but your relationship will um, can get much stronger when you just say, you know what? I got to release this and I got to ask God to guide me because there's no map and you can't look at what other people are doing because other people's children are different and have different needs and their family structure is different. And so, you know, through my own experience, I just thank God for him leading me. And I thank God for myself being open, like, the experience I had a lot of times, I was just open because sometimes you, you become open when you just, you know, frustrated. Like, you know, I don't know where to turn. I don't know what to do, mm-hmm. what next. Um, and so there are times when I just say, Lord, this, you know, you got, you got to take this. <laughs> you know, you just gotta, I got to, I got to trust you. Um, you know, and, and you just got to take this. And, and, and over my experiences, that has really worked well. And I wish Sometimes I had given it to him before and not waited till I was, you know, frustrated and and I went in and then asked him to step in, Mm -hmm. (laughs) like trust him. But um, I I, I really feel like I haven't had a good experience, even though I've had a lot of ups and downs. But through it, I just trust that he is going to work it out because you can do all the check off boxes and do all the right things and still don't have it all together. So it's, it's a journey and I just appreciate, um, the, the, the way that he's taking me through this journey and all the wonderful people that I have met and all the experiences because it's, it, it took me away from what my original, um, uh, occupation was. Mm. And then I turned into, doing something that I did not get formal education to do, but it has been life rewarding for me. Mm-hmm. Like I wake up thinking, how can I help families that are on this journey, you know, improve their life. So I, I can just, you know, say with my experience, um, I changed the narrative. Mm-hmm. Um, that's one of the things that I often say, you know, you can take this journey and just talk about all the negative piece of it, or you can take it and just say, you know what? I'm just so grateful that my child's healthy. I'm just so grateful that they were able to experience education. I'm so grateful for this educator and this doctor, you know, and in and, and this program and mm. the people that you encountered that really lifted you up. So it, it, it all depends. Um, I think, or many people on their experiences is the narrative. Mm. And I, I just always try to change whatever the narrative of looking like it's going on in a positive, like a negative way. I try to change it into a, a positive. Wow. Yeah. That, that I, I like that um, phrase. I wrote it down even to Melanie about changing the narrative because, <laughs> because in some ways our, our story is also written by us, right. And uh-huh. what, what, what path we're going to take um, and how we're going to move through that path. And of course there's other things that are going to block it and uh, <laughs> get us off course, but it is a story we help to write, you know, right. as well. Right. So what do you think is the most valuable lesson you have learned in supporting your daughter? 
become believing in her, the, mm. the, the, the belief, the strength of them, my faith, believe that this too shall pass. And a lot of times um, people on the outside, you know, they, they're looking in like, oh, that's your story. And I'm like, no, that's not my story. This too shall pass, you know. Um, that that's to me the most valuable thing that I have taken because who she was at three wasn't who she was at thirteen, and at thirteen she um she's not what what she was at, at twenty three. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of things improved, but I looking back would have thought, oh my goodness, that's never going to change. Right. Like that's set in stone, but it wasn't, and she's still evolving and growing and changing and learning. Right, right. So the most valuable lesson is to keep believing, even when it doesn't look good. It, you know, just keep a positive, uh, affirmational way of thinking and speaking. You know, speak positive um, affirmations and teach your child to speak it. You right. know, I think that's one of the most valuable things that we used to do waiting for the bus stop. You know, I used to tell her, you are special. You are dynamic. You are awesome. And and get get her to recite it. Um and then I, I start to feel it. I even feel like she believed it. And <laughs> she's looking at me, you know, and, and I'm saying, Oh no, you can get you can do it. go go for it. You can you can change you, you can change the narrative. Like this will change. And um it started to happen. Overnight. It wasn't no therapist that came in <laughs> and did no treatment plan. It was, <laughs> Overnight, she went from not brushing her teeth, from hating that sensory experience, to automatically going in as brushing her teeth. Right, right. That's just an example of how. And I thought, wow, you know, this is gonna be like this forever. But then I had to say, you know what? This too shall change. Come on, let's brush your teeth. <laughs> <You know? laughs> right. And now she does it. Like now she loves to do it. Right. But um, that's one of the valuable, I think things that I've taken over this experience is just you got to believe things will get better even mm -hmm. when it doesn't look like it you yeah. know and I, I think that's kind of also uh, pointing to what you said about getting a, a faith community around you to help you to continue that belief yes. <laughs> um, you know because of course it's very difficult, right? And uh, um, it's hard to sometimes see the achievements, like brushing your teeth, right? That, that's an achievement for your daughter, but it, it, it didn't look like it was going to be realized. I'm sure there's other examples, <laughs> you know, right. that you could point to, but, um, but having that faith community around you um, is very important. A good faith community, we should say, right? <laughs> right, a good faith community, really positive energy. Positive energy. Mm -hmm. So good. When those things seem like forever that you know, this is never going to come to fruition, you have people pour pouring in like, "Oh, don't worry about that. That's okay. You know, it's no big thing." Um, but they are they are believing in you and your child. You know, you really have to surround yourself with people like that. You have to create a village that believe in you, and they don't all have, have they don't all have to be specialists. Right. You know. Whether it's the, the nice neighbor in your neighborhood or the lady at the grocery store counter that's always putting good energies into you and speaking to your child, those things mean a lot, and, and they give you that 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 hope that things will get better. And what you listen to and what you uh, see on TV, all of those things play a major role. Um, in developing your life and how you are able to get up every morning to be hopeful. Um, so you do have to pay attention to that, your, your village okay. and your sensory. Mm. Yes. Good. Excellent advice. Um, and I know that uh, we in um, all the service providers, faith community, advocates, individuals living with disabilities, uh, there's many challenges that are facing um, our community, and I include everyone in that as well, uh, including people with disabilities. So what do you think are some of those biggest challenges facing uh, this community, um, uh, including service providers, um, advocates, 
um, and of course, people living with intellectual and developmental disabilities. What do you What do you think are some of the biggest challenges? I think some of the biggest challenges we we face is accessibility, making sure that we have opportunities for inclusion to mm -hmm. to be integrate to be true citizens of our community. That that is thought about, and and and, and we're not on the last, you know, uh, on the last on the list, you know, of how do we support people with uh, disabilities in our community and making sure that they have access to programs and mm -hmm. programs and mm -hmm. services. So I think the accessibility piece, the inclusion um, piece, um, of course, employment, yes, you yeah. know, the lack of employment opportunities and affordable, accessible housing. Right, right. Yeah, I know that's um, kind of one of the, I think, maybe not the most worrying part for a mother, but I think the mother is always thinking about the future and, and um, what happens when I'm gone. That's that's different than for um, perhaps a mother who may not have children with intellectual and developmental disabilities. That That's kind of a more on the, 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 the forefront of the... Um, uh, a special needs mom, I would think. Definitely. I mean, that's one of our biggest fears. And it sometimes stops us from planning. Because if you can't see uh, a pathway, then you just say, okay, I just am not going to do deal with that at all, which is one of the worst things you could do. So you definitely want to look into the future and ha having that conversation about such as housing, like, what, would, what is that going to look like in 20 years when I'm no longer here and my loved one needs a home, you know, mm -hmm. hopefully a home of their own um, with good supports. Um, but having starting to have the conversation now is the key to dealing with the challenges that we have to communicate those challenges. Yeah, and I, and, and I do think, again, pointing to that, that's, to me, one of the major differences, uh, you know, all moms, of course, want the best for their sons and daughters and um, trying to meet those challenges. But again, for a mom supporting a son or daughter with intellectual and developmental disabilities, they have to constantly be thinking about future planning, <laughs> um, I think, in a vastly different way than I would yes. say other parents do. Yes. Yeah, that's right. yes. The future is not really the future. It's the now planning. But we call it future <laughs> yeah. planning. But it's what you do now that makes sure the future is okay. And it's a seamless process when you're no longer here and your family member, uh, family members are grieving. But then the family member who has the, the, the challenges does not have a plan. And mm. so their life can be interrupted in such a traumatic way. Now they've lost their mom, and now they may lose their benefits mm -hmm. or things because the proper um, planning was not put in place mm -hmm. for their benefits, uh, for their financial needs. So that is one of our biggest, you know, concerns and challenges. But I don't think we should feel so challenged enough that we don't start planning. We don't do something. We don't have the conversations with our family members, with our providers, with our uh, disability community advocates. We, we need to have the conversation of the things that do, do challenge us in the special needs community. So that kind of points to my next question very well about how do we beat these challenges. And I think it's, again, planning from diagnosis day one, right? Right. right. <laughs> Thinking about that future from that moment you know, what you know, it could be at different times, right? When you when you know as a mother, but kind of that planning uh, piece is is more vital, I would say. I don't know if you agree with that. Uh, the, I, I so do, critical. I, um, I believe that the information and the visionary picture mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that was uh, provided to me when my child was five, it changed my trajectory. Mm. It changed what was acceptable, you know, and unacceptable. It was, you know, certain things was like, okay, pass on that because that's not the path that I see my child in 20 years or 25, 30 years. So it's, 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 it is 
really crucial that um, we know the different things that's going to happen in the different life stages so that you get a sneak peek at what, what's going to happen at eight when your child is one. And then what happens from at eight, you want to know what's, what's going to happen at 16. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. those, those things are very helpful. So I often share with younger families the, the importance of that planning because that planning is it's tremendous. You know, something can happen to one of the family members and that will throw off that loved one's, um, you know, trajectory of getting the right supports and services. So definitely um, getting the information on the different life stages um, is important. So, so that was a great lead in too, Melanie, to about thinking about that. Um, that, of course, there's different challenges for moms supporting a child with developmental disabilities that we know is an infant versus, you know, school age and continuing on. Um, and do you think um, the community of support around mothers needs to change as well, depending on the life stage of their um, son or daughter? I think in, it, it looks different. The types mm-hmm. of support and the early intervention, um, you want to just meet up um, emotionally to, with other parents because um, you have the educational system kind of figuring out the, the treatment plan or the educational plan and you've got your medical uh, providers helping you with the treatment plan. So you have a lot of um, support in that sense. So the, the support kind of, you know, changes when the your child gets a little older mm-hmm. and, they're, and they're 14 and 15 and it's now trying to figure out what life is going to look like once they finish their education, their formal education. Right. And that type of support, you, you need more, you need to connect with parents like you did younger, but it's, it's a different conversation. Um, it, so you still need that support. That same parental exchange, I always say, and it lessens when the child gets older. Mm. So you don't see as many moms at the soccer field and yeah, the <laughs> yes. child talking. It, it lessens, and so that creates a barrier because you're not getting information. Right. And then your child is getting older, so the school is not talking to you as frequently as when they were younger. And so that becomes a, a big barrier as they get older the, the types of um, support that you need so you need a lot of educational you know forms to, to start to figure out the benefits and, and what kind of technology support you might need um, uh, equipment that your know, loved one may need when they're no longer in school mm-hmm. um, what, what's the post-secondary educational means going to look like you know um what programs, what benefits, you know, for long-term support services you're going to need to have in place. Some people need a lot more personal care support. Mm, Some yeah. people don't. But as a parent, you're not going to know that unless you have some other parental exchange mm. and you are going to support group meetings. Right, right. That often tapers off for a lot of families, and that's one of the biggest um, challenges. I, I try to tell families, please stay engaged. Yeah. Um, and it's not easy to digest the information because they're getting older right. and it's not um, grouped together as when they're younger. Oh, this program is already established. We're just moving to this. It becomes very individualized right. when you get older. And so um, that, that creates a lot more um, stretch <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right because so the support continues the support continues and I guess again thinking again that life trajectory I like how you mentioned that for your son or daughter it it really is looking at the entire life trajectory of of that person um and kind of shifting and, and changing those supports um, depending on that life stage of their son and of the mom, right? Because their right. moms change too, of course. Right. <laughs> we yeah, we, your we, we get older change. as well. <laughs> That's right. Your, yeah, the family members, the siblings are growing, siblings, they're leaving yeah. to go to college. So that your support needs may change. Um, 
you know, was inside the house, you, where you live at, you right. might have changed. So a lot of changes do occur, but trying to identify your uh, support base is, is critical. Yeah, excellent advice. And I, I know, uh, Melanie, you're an excellent advocate for this and, and all the work you do about that community of support. Um, but thinking about our moms specifically, who do you think are the players in our community? Again, we kind of think a lot about service providers, but outside of service provider, who are the players in our community that can be a support for uh, special needs moms? I, I often tell people, look into um, uh, special needs ministry, mm -hmm. where they have a lot of activities, a lot of support going on and, and engagement so that you can find other moms. Um, when you're doing certain activities and therapies and you're in the, um, the lobby of that um, you know, clinic or, or therapy, um, to kind of connect and engage with families. Ask that therapist, do they have... Um, parent groups so little coffee mm, breaks because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. some, sometimes they do have that take advantage of, of that um, any type of disability support group like pods or um, autism you know support groups you know connect even if they're not in your community like they, they might be in another jurisdiction so you might have to drive to Anne Arundel County or Howard County mm, mm -hmm. if they're not in Prince George's County that is worth um, go to, to, to sometimes see what other jurisdictions are doing it and, and connect with those um, parents um, and to see what their vision yeah. is, is like and what they have going on in their community. Um, sometimes hospitals have support groups. Oh, interesting. You know? Right. Yeah, we forget children's about that. Hospital, mm -hmm. They may have, uh, children's hospital have medical navigators. Mm -hmm. uh, they call complex care navigators. And so, the, you know, that's a major player, somebody to help you navigate through the medical, you know, uh, system. Um, sometimes universities have programs where they have support groups. So I would definitely research that and check into that. Um, some of the uh, waiver services, if you're getting um, developmental disability administration um, benefit services, they have family training that mm. offers with okay. that. So that. The autism waiver has family trainings um, offered. Um, at the ARC, we have like workshops and training. They become like a support group. People start to recognize each other and mm. start mm -hmm. um, engaging in conversations and, you know, even carpooling. Uh, <laughs> Great. Together yeah. to activities that is something that is is a, is a parent that you really want to identify who are some of the players um and they they might be people that are in the disability community but sometimes they might be players that are outside of the disability community that really can help and support you so don't um you know dis disregard the the neighbor or the friend that you have lunch with every so often right because that can provide you with a lot of emotional um, support. Right. Um, and sometimes it's helpful to get a perspective outside of the circles we're in as well. <laughs> that right, that kind of right. helps us to look look uh, at, from the outside in. Sometimes we need that help um, outside of that service provider circle. And um, I appreciate the ideas about hospitals. We shouldn't forget those as resources. Um, and, and other areas. We don't even have to stay in our own um, community. We can also look at others. <laughs> right. And if you have a, if you have a hobby mm, or a, nice, something, yeah. those, they can, that could be support to you because everything cannot be about the disability. That's, a disability. that's right. That's right. You know, it's a part of your life. You know, that's not your whole narrative. That's not your whole family narrative. Even though it may play a big role that, Sure, not do certainly. a lot of things if you don't have those supports in place. But I just want people not to make it your whole narrative. There's another part of life. You got interests and you got favorite activities or hobbies, or maybe you want to continue your education. Um, think of that as also a support to you to yeah. help you cope. Um, yeah. And most of all, you know, having a conversation with God and sharing your thoughts. And listening to him in, in those quiet moments mm. can be the best support because you know he is with you at all times. That's right. That's right. When <laughs> others are wait. not there. That's right. <laughs> right. You got to wait. You know, 
you know, just called up at 8 o'clock in the morning. You, you could talk to him at any time of the day and night. And so he'll comfort you, you know, so that's some of the things that I have to sometimes get quiet. Mm, just yeah. have nothing on but get quiet so that I can hear him telling me, you know. And sometimes he don't say nothing. <laughs> that's right. Just, just sometimes you just got to get quiet because you can get too many voices in your head and you get confused. Yes. So just um, kind of balancing it out is the key. Yes, that's right. That's right. And and sometimes when I hear uh, moms introduce themselves and they always say, well, I'm so-and-so's mother or I'm a special needs mom and they don't even say their name. Like, well, right. well you, you are a person first. <laughs> yes, you are a mother and yes, your child has special needs. But don't forget, you are a person who's who's had a life and achievements and, and everything else. So 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 say your name. <laughs> that's right. That's just a part of your story. It's not your whole story. That's right. Say right. your name. <laughs> Don't worry. Um so so yes, we were talking a lot about supports and how the community um can surround our, our mothers. Um but what what is your hope for your daughter's future? What what, what is your hope? As a mom. <laughs> As a mom, my hope is that she has a life just filled with in the community. That she truly uh, practice living in the community. She has a community, a practice life. Mm. And that she's in the driver's seat. You know, that it's it's what she truly wants, not what's available. You know, that she's directing mm. <laughs> her activities. She's, uh, you know, directing the people that, that she wants to live with. Mm, she may not want to live mm-hmm. with anybody. Or the support staff that she's hiring and firing. Um, those, those are the things that I, I, my wish for her, that she has a home of her own. Mm, um, mm-hmm. That she has the employment that she likes and wants to get up every morning to do. Um, and that she has a social life. Like, not just the people that is paid. Mm, it's, mm-hmm. it, it, it's people that the desire to uh, hang around her and, and, and go to the movies and go out to eat, bowl, and, you know what I'm saying? Like, she has friends, you know. Um, and then she continues her education that may look different. So whether it's her learning how to cook, her learning some uh, how to plant a garden, or you know, continuing education is, is, it looks different. She might be taking a different type of exercise class, but that the brain is always growing to me. Mm, she's always learning. And yeah. nurtured. Um, I just want different experiences. And that she has a vacation, you know, every year. And that she gets a chance to be her her most wellness. Yeah, her best that, self. That she has a wellness life. That's like, right. Yeah, I, I I have a cup in my office too that says an enviable lives that yeah, <laughs> we yeah. want to create that life that everyone would want. Yeah. <laughs> so I try to remember saying. that. <laughs> yeah. So Melanie, I hope you can stay on the line a few more moments, and um, um, as we kind of uh, bring down our our or sorry, uh, wrap up our webinar. Um, but. I think often, too, uh, since we were talking about our um, faith community, I think we can often ask God, why? Why did things happen and um, to us? And, and we should ask questions, <laughs> um, and, and even questions including about our faith. Uh, throughout our own salvation history, uh, prophets, saints, and everyday people, and even Jesus himself on the cross have questioned why this is happening to me, um, happening to our community. Uh, where are you, God? Uh, St. Teresa of Calcutta uh, herself, a great saint of our time, described in her writings about having the dark night of the soul um, during a time when her own faith wavered. Um, and here we have an example of a person admired and uh, cherished by many people. And uh, and even herself had it, what she described as the dark night of the soul. Um, our role as a church community should be a place of comfort and hope, not a place of no, or we cannot help your child here or your teen or your uh, adult. 
a culture of life that we believe in our church community also includes being a support for families, including mothers raising a child or sometimes our mothers have uh, children with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So what are some other ways we can be a supportive community of faith um, as ministry leaders, family, friends, parishioners, and members of the community. Uh, so often um, um, we think about how we can support families or have a ministry or, or uh, religious education. And uh, when the moms come to us as church leaders, we tell her, oh, that's fine, but you can lead it. But uh, as Melanie described, our mothers are very overwhelmed and, and, and tired. So uh, maybe leading it would be a stretch, but we certainly should ask for their input on how we could create uh, ministries that will serve their needs. But we could still have the invitation, uh, as Melanie mentioned, but um, it doesn't mean they have to always lead those ministries or, or programs. I think... Um, Anytime a mom receives criticism, like, why can't you control your child or um, why um, is she continuing to do that? Um, I think a better response as, as uh, parishioners and ministry leaders is, how can we help you today? Well, what is there something we can do to be of help? Um, a welcoming atmosphere at our churches. Um, everybody can be a part of that. You don't need to be... A, an expert on disability to say hello to someone and help a family feel welcomed. If you have a business or if you are a hiring manager and um, consider employing an adult living with disabilities, um, uh, Melanie mentioned that hope for her own daughter. Um, and there are many people in our church communities who own businesses or perhaps are in a position to do hiring. So. Think about that as being embracing those families fully um, as their son or daughter becomes an adult and is looking for that full inclusion, including working. Of course, we can be part of advocacy both at a, a government level and even at our own church level for supports. Again, you don't need to be an expert on disability, uh, just needing to be a support and another voice to help um, those services uh, continue or grow. And celebrate all those achievements um, and listen to the dark moments. Uh, I think maybe, Melanie, you might agree with this too, that sometimes um, a special needs mom isn't allowed to have a dark moment. <laughs> um, uh, she must always be positive and must always be, you know, the strong person. But, you know, those... Um, dark moments come and we need to be there for them as well during during those times. And uh, I think a simple thing we can do too is take a special needs mom out. Um, I, I try myself to do that as well, um, where she could just have an hour or two not to talk about therapies, not to talk about um, uh, individual education plans, but actually just to have um, a time and fellowship. And we can do that in many different ways. Uh, here you find a, a very short list of resources, and this is also available as a handout on this webinar that you can print out. Um, as Melanie mentioned, there are many different uh, groups. Um, one that I'm familiar with is uh, Parent to Parent um, in Montgomery County, where a, a parent is paired with another parent uh, to be a peer mentor, uh, which is very um, strengthening for, for moms. Um, there's different respite programs. One in Prince George's County is called yes. Buddy Break. So uh, th that's an excellent program that allows moms that time to rest in, as well. Uh, we have many community resource organizations all across the Archdiocese of Washington. And if you click on that link on your resource page, you will find um, where they are located. And they're all across um, the Archdiocese of Washington for activities and social opportunities for teens, older teens and adults. Um, I just recently came across this resource called Moms in Prayers, and this is actually a, a Christian ecumenical resource where, where moms get together and pray, um, uh, which is a wonderful way to support uh, one another. And this is um, a, a Christian ecumenical uh, resource. And also for moms that may have received a severe or 
fatal prenatal diagnosis. Um, Isaiah's promise is a wonderful support to those moms who just found out maybe, and sometimes diagnosis is even at that time when um, uh, pregnant that you find out that your child may have a significant disability. And here at the Archdiocese of Washington, we have that support available for those moms. Again, a, a, a mom who's experienced that, um, helping a mom who has just found out. So again, that, that mom to mom support. And of course, there's many other different resources and supports, but here, here's a brief list for you here. So uh, we do have just a very few moments uh, to uh, have questions. If you have any questions or comments and there's a chat box available on the right side of your screen. Um, so please feel free to enter any comments or questions you might have. And I also have our contact information here for us uh, here at the Archdiocese of Washington, Department of Special Needs Ministries. So um, I wanna mention as you're preparing your questions um, to be typed in here to our chat box, um, our next uh, brunch bunch, which is a partnership between the ARC Prince George's County, Prince George's Community Resources, and the Archdiocese of Washington. Um, we meet on the fourth Thursday of every month at the Holy Family Catholic Church Heritage Room. And I think Melanie would agree with this, that that group informally has uh, been a support to one another. I think the moms have found ways to connect with each other um, before or after our brunch bunch. And this month, we are focusing in on uh, mental health, as May is Mental Health Awareness Month. So please, you're most welcome to join us there on May 23rd from 11 to 1. And we do serve a brunch um, to hear from Colette Harris, who is the executive director for uh, Nominee Prince George's County. And also here in Prince George's County, we have the Spiritual Community Collaboration, uh, which our next meeting will be in July. So please stay tuned for information on that. And that's a way where all faith leaders, community leaders, advocates, persons living with disabilities come and learn more on how the faith community can be a support for family and other res resources. So stay tuned for details on our uh, spiritual community collaboration, which has been a wonderful resource uh, and support. Our next uh, Lunch and Learn will be in June. Again, or we try to stay to the second Thursday of the month. Uh, this month we would come here on a Wednesday, but uh, we will discuss how um, teen faith mentors um, have been uh, used in different parishes and other faith communities to help children with learning needs um, experience their faith and learn more about it. So please join us in June for that um, a session on our webinar about how teens are helping to um, transform the children that they are teaching and I believe also transforming their own lives as well as lives of service. Uh, so uh, Melanie, I don't see any questions here, um, but um, I don't know if you would like to add any concluding thoughts as we uh, finish our webinar here today. It's been a wonderful uh, celebration of mothers. I wonder if you'd like to have any concluding thoughts though. Oh, um, thank you, Ron. Thank you for having me. Um, this was a wonderful opportunity to talk to mothers and just want mothers to constantly remember that they have to celebrate themselves, mm -hmm. even when um, the rest of the world, you know, is going about its business. We often need to uh, check in and take breaks and, and celebrate ourselves frequently and not just uh, one time a once year. Once a month or, or once break. a year. Yes, just right. Once a year. We just need to celebrate <laughs> the good work that we do of caring uh, for family members. Um, so I just want to celebrate moms. You know, keep up the good work. All right, great. I, I think that's a great way to end our webinar today about celebrating mothers. And thank you again, Melanie, for sharing your uh, wisdom and experiences and also for your uh, work supporting our families here, um, not just in Prince George's County, but I know uh, beyond. And please stay in touch with us here and the Department of Special Needs Ministries. Um, and, and 
and find our Facebook page and also Twitter. We're at ADWSNM um, or shoot us an email or, or certainly give us a call. We, we, we still like to take calls as well. <laughs> um, so feel free to reach out to us as well. So again, thank you, Melanie, and thank you everyone who joined us today for our webinar. All right, thank you so much.